Okay, so welcome everybody. We're going to start and whoever is going to join us will join us. Uh, we have uh, about an hour, so we have enough time for everyone to join us whenever they can. So um, I would like to welcome all of you to this opening panel of the first Digital Eco Fashion Week. Starting today, all the future sustainable, ethical, and slow fashion brands collections are showcasing on designers2buyers.com, who also produced this event. So thank you. <laughs> uh, we invite you to sign in and view this exciting collection. So today, our first panel is about the challenges and the opportunities for sustainable fashion brands during the COVID-19 period. So my name is Liraz Cohen Mordecai, and I'm going to be the moderator of today's panel. Um, I'm a founder of a company called Fashionating by Leary. And before I even started with this company that I'll tell you a little bit about uh, in a second, I actually worked in um, Inditex as the manager of the training and development department in Israel. And later on, I had uh, my own fashion blog. But about six years ago, I watched a movie that I believe that all of you uh, probably watched it. And it's kind of like a fundamental movie. The true cost really gave me the understanding of what is the, the not the good things that's coming out of the fashion industry. And that completely shifted everything that I did. I opened my company, as I said, and the entire mission of the company is to empower and support local Israeli designers to succeed globally. And we do that through tours and programs and lectures and, uh, and so on. But the, the mission and the values behind it, it's really about slow fashion, sustainability, inclusivity, and so on. Today, our panel is much broader than just the Israeli fashion industry. We're talking with global fashion designers from all over the world, and we will uh, hear their perspective of everything that's going on today. But just kind of a recap of fashion, sustainability, and COVID-19. So prior to COVID-19 crisis, we already started to witness more sustainability programs and commitments in the apparel, the footwear, the textile industry, and in various segments, including luxury, sports, fast fashion, and value retail. Um, the efforts were a combination between the environmental aspect and the social aspect, and it include water, carbon, chemical consumption, but also workforce health, safety, well-being, and compensation. And we really started to see this trend evolving from many different reasons, from the consumer preferences and mainly the young generation to the climate disruption that made the fashion business model itself very vulnerable. Now, with COVID-19, uh, that caused a huge shock for the entire fashion industry. Uh, we're talking about retail businesses who are temporarily closed, brands that are adjusting to declining customer spending, uh, manufacturers all over the world face cancellations of completed and near completed orders. And this is something that's already causing devastating ripple effects. Um, what we're estimating that the crisis is expected to wipe out more than 30% of the fashion industry business in 2020 alone. Only in the US, we already heard about 27 retail companies that filed for bankruptcy. So enough with the good news. Uh, let's talk with our four panelists who basically leave, read, and sleep sustainability and fashion. Uh, and I want to hear from them what is their kind of experience and insights um, during COVID-19. So if each one of the panelists can just introduce yourself in two, three sentences, just giving us some kind of a background about who you are, who you are, where are you from, um, and what is kind of like your agenda. So Ad, maybe we can start with you. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Liri. Um, well, so my name is Aude Penuti. I'm from France, and uh, I'm a fashion designer who became a cultural broker. So I will explain later on what a cultural broker is, but basically uh, I've been working for 15 years uh, and I spent 12 years abroad in Asia, in Italy and in US. And uh, seven years ago, I started my own consulting office dedicated to sustainable projects where I'm doing some sourcing exercise, uh, product development. And two years ago, when I came back to Europe, uh, thanks to my 
pretty wide experience, both in sourcing in factories, but also in developing products, in working with different kind of brands from everywhere. I also started to create some digital content for magazines and fairs and so on. So I do a lot of research from the very beginning of the, of the chain to the very end when I talk to consumer. Amazing, thank you. Uh, Rebecca, maybe you'll go second. Hi, so I come to you from the United States, although I have also lived and worked abroad in Europe as well as in Asia. My background is in law and nonprofit management and advocacy. And I worked in that arena for a while before moving into sustainable fashion. I was a frustrated consumer who felt like I could not find the clothes that I needed in terms of the aesthetic that I needed for my values, vocation, and aesthetic. And so I decided to create them. So I created a company called Maven Women, and we have day to evening pieces. So the type of pieces that you can wear if you are a lawyer or a teacher or a doctor or someone who has kind of a, a more classic aesthetic. And you can wear them all day. And I'm wearing one of them right now. And we also engage thoughtfully in cross industry partnerships. So my ultimate goal is to move the needle in the industry however I can. And Maven Women is certainly part of that. However, we love working with other, other companies and other nonprofits. And I look forward to sharing more about that work today and also speaking some about the part that we can all play in banding together and using this terrible, terrible season for our world um, and finding some of the, the opportunities for change, realizing that even though there are some opportunities there, I think we need to be honest about the fact that there is great struggle and, and great suffering. Right, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Camila? Hi, everyone. I'm Camila Carrara, and I'm based in Milano, in Italy. Uh, I'm the founder and designer of Zero Barra Cento, that is a brand focusing on zero waste, uh, gender neutral outerwear. And my background is in fashion. And after a, a first bachelor, I decided to do a master in sustainable fashion. And starting from that time, I've been focusing on the zero waste pattern, pattern making technique and also on responsible sourcing, always with focus on made in Italy because I'm trying to keep all the production chain as traced as possible. And um, before creating my own brand, I worked inside textile companies and consultancy companies for sustainability. So my focus has always been in textiles and fashion. Amazing, thank you. Um, so maybe Ad, uh, maybe we'll start with you, the consultant here. Your company in Tata Textile, you consult various designers and brands and schools. What do you think is the biggest challenge now during COVID-19 period? Is it different than the challenges that your uh, clients were facing prior to COVID-19 and in what way? Yeah, it's definitely different because <laughs> it's the size is bigger. As Rebecca said, it's a big struggle and that's an international struggle. So I will just speak about France because this is where I'm staying right now. And uh, there is many uh, layers where companies have to really rethink the way they are projecting themselves, the, the way they are planning things. The first one is, I would say, it's to adapt to change and uncertain, uncertainty, sorry, uh, in a short term uh, moment, because they have to, to adapt to the short term market reaction. So they notice that they've been struggled because of the sourcing and production, which when it's abroad and when it's only abroad, it's a big problem. So for instance, in France, we have now a big campaign of regularization to be able to um, products and to, to make some things in France from the fiber to the final products. Another one could be that uh, we were thinking production in terms of volume, and now uh, the market is going also going more and more for transparency. And basically, when a customer wants an information, uh, they will be able to find it. So coming from volume production to valuable production, and how does it work to adapt yourself? And also another subject we've been talking about, you and I, it's how sustainability and digital tools are becoming long-term agile solutions and are not only opportunities. Uh, sustainability for me is, is not um, a concept or a strategy anymore. It's an habit that company have to catch up 
if they want to stay alive. Yes, completely. And what do you think about um, the designers? You mentioned in our previous conversation that um, young designers or small brands maybe have more opportunity here during COVID-19 um, um, rather than the big brands because they're more agile. Can you maybe elaborate more on this? Yeah, exactly. Uh, they are more flexible in terms of strategy. Uh, they have less, um, maybe they have less incomes, but on, on the other side, they also have less, you know, uh, fees. So they are, they are, I think they are, they are able to find a place and to, to go to sometimes to niche markets, you know, when big companies, they have to consult all the layers, all they have to be careful about the process in the company. Um, sometimes they have big uh, purchase uh, process and they have to rethink everything. So it's not, it's not uh, so easy for them. When DNVBs, uh, first of all, sometimes they are not coming from textile, which could be a, by po a bad point, but actually it's a very strong asset because they are coming to disrupt the market and they are able to uh, create a collaboration with professional and so their knowledge from uh, marketing from uh, production from engineering wherever whatever combining to professionals this is coming this is becoming something super strong on the market and they're able to catch the very uh, strong asset and the very uh, imp the big importance of what is digital in today in terms of production but also in terms of sales so this is a big, uh, big asset for me, for them. Yeah, Rebecca, I see you're, uh, you're kind of agreeing. And so both you and Camila have uh, your own fashion brands. I'm interested and curious to hear what you think about that. So Camila, I mentioned uh, the ability to be agile. Can you maybe tell us more about, uh, first of all, what is your zero waste technique in your brand? Um, and what are some major changes and challenges that you encountered during COVID-19 and how you adapted to the, to the challenges? Sure. Uh, so the zero waste pattern technique, uh, pattern making technique is a technique that allows to use the 100% of the fabric while making the pattern making. And uh, this means that at least 15% of waste is uh, saved because usually at least the 15% of the fabric is wasted during the production phase. So also for a small brand is really like about optimizing also the cost of production because considering high quality materials, this could really impact on the final price of the production. And um, I'm super uh, in agreement with the Thing of saying that versatility is something super positive for small realities because for example um, in our case uh, we are producing outerwear so when we had the lockdown from uh, March till uh, almost June in Italy we were totally shocked because we said no one will buy any more outerwear there is no reason to do it so we, re uh, we, start re we started rethinking a little bit what we could offer to our final consumers. And we started producing some kimonos, for example, that could be super suitable as loungewear, for example, but also for nightwear when the thing will happen again when we were back to normal life. So um, we offered this possibility to choose the fabric. And then we were producing really unique pieces. So this is something that if you have really a big company with uh, or may already established a supply chain, it's not easy to do. But for us, it has been really just about rethinking a little bit our way to, to work and to find a solution that has really uh, made us, gave us the possibility to survive as well, because we needed to sell also during that period. And we were happy to find like um, an object that was, uh, giving value to the new life that we all were experiencing because we wanted to bring a little bit the uh, pleasure that usually we try to offer to our to our uh, items also with these new models and we were happy to see our, like our new customers uh, satisfied and also the way they were let's say wearing these new items so it was interesting and we are keeping uh, offering this kind of product because we really saw uh, that now consumers are more sensitive also to, to the uniqueness of the items uh, 
and also to maybe something that can be versatile in terms of use. So this is something that we are keeping on the side of our, uh, let's say, conventional collection. So yeah. anything else that you're uh, that you're seeing from uh, your customers that are asking in terms of sizes? You talked about the versatility, but um, I know in our in our prior conversation you mentioned also. Yeah. Um, we are. I mean. We think that comfort is becoming more and more something that people are looking for. So we have always been uh, offering something that is kind of oversized, but we saw that now is even more requested and also all these fluffy wools for the winter that are more comfy and like uh, they yag your body. So it seems that people are looking for something that is really giving a kind of a hug to themselves. So it's really like pleasure on pleasure. I don't know how to, to explain more, but it's true that there is really this need of finding pleasure while wearing something. So maybe buying a little bit less, but investing maybe something more. And when we spoke, we, I told you that I saw this sensitivity, measure sensitivity on like um, investment pieces. I hope it will keep being like this for a long time, I'm not sure, but I truly hope that all the values that we have uh, uh, rediscovered during this period will last. That's super interesting. Patrick, I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Hi, um, good morning. The uh, introduction of each one of the panelists, so maybe you can just tell us in uh, two, three sentences who you are, where are you <laughs> located right now, what are you doing? <laughs> Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Cupid. I'm a women's ready to wear designer based in New York. Uh, and right now, uh, we're in the middle of relaunching uh, uh, spring 20th, spring 21, and then moving forward uh, toward the next collection for fall winter uh, 2021. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so I will get to you in a second. But Rebecca, sure. maybe also, um, address uh, kind of what Camila was talking about and some of the changes. For you, I find it super interesting because your brand, Maven Women, offers professional women as attire. And I'm not sure, do women still need professional attire today? Um, we see rise in other categories, such as athletic leisure, uh, on the core. How are you adapting to this new normal in uh, what way you think the next collection yeah, I mean, well, and, and that's a lot of questions. So first of all, I think if you are a brand that was founded based on sustainability, which we are, the goal isn't to just make as much money as you can as a brand. It is to serve the goal of sustainability in the industry. There are so many good sustainable athleisure brands today. I don't want to try and go after their market share when they are doing a very good job. That doesn't make sense business-wise. And it doesn't make sense in terms of the goals of us as a company. Um, I, and I can give some names like Packed Apparel is doing a really beautiful job. They've been in this space for a long time. I love their pieces. They're extremely affordable. I'm not gonna try and make a different legging than Packed Apparel is going to make. And there's so many other great examples for leggings out there. Like Girlfriend Collective is great. Summer Salt has some really nice pieces and they are kind of went from the swimmer resort wear into athleisure, which makes a lot of sense. So, um, and I think asking yourself, are you gonna wear athleisure all day long, every day, especially when the pandemic eventually subsides, which in the US could be a very, very long time. And the answer is no, as kind of the whole idea, like people wanna wear something special. Do you wanna wear your pajamas all day long, every single day? Well, maybe some people do and that's fine. And we may adapt to a world where you're working from home and you can do that. And we've already seen that in some of the cities on the West Coast. You go to a place like San Francisco and people are wearing hoodies to work at Fortune 500 companies. Right. However, the requirements of people who are going into court are not going to change. The type of mm -hmm. styles that certain women appreciate and enjoy are not gonna change. You look at someone who's a fashion icon in the United States, like Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, she is still a fashion icon in this country. You're gonna go out, whether it's to walk in the garden or on a date with your girlfriends or your partner, um, 
I, I think that we still need a variety of categories. I don't think people are going to be getting married in pajamas. Some people might, but probably most people won't. Well now, are people going to be spending a larger percentage of their time wearing athleisure? Probably. And are people gonna be more comfort focused? Yes. And I think that's also another thing that's really important at Maven Women, because the type of clothes we create, there's been an emphasis on wearing things like pantyhose or stockings or shapewear and doing things that to me are just very uncomfortable and impractical. So I hope in the space that I'm in, some of those expectations for women that are uncomfortable, impractical, or not a good use of resources are changing. And people are looking for garments that are flattering, that are slimming because of the cut and the silhouette and the style and the type of material. You know, if if, are people gonna, if if, let's say we had a hypothetically 10% market share, might that change for for our aesthetic? Might that change to go down to a 7% or even a 5% market share with the changes of the pandemic? Possibly. Does that mean that there's still no market? Absolutely not. Okay, that's good to know. People are still wearing their professional attire, even if well, they're- Well, I'm, I'm not saying whether they are, are, aren't wearing it right now in this season to the same extent. However, I have friends who work in the corporate world. You can't wear pajamas on a meeting with a client. And even in our, just if we're taking our panel just now, we are all dressed up um, in, in a certain manner, right? Like that's- even in the Zoom calls, we do care, even if it's just like on the top part of our, right. we still- Yes, we, you, you, a collared button down shirt is what you're speaking in yeah. right now. And I think that the collared button down shirt isn't going to just become a, a collared button down pajama top for right. everyone all the time. Uh, thanks, Rebecca. Patrick, um, so you have your own brand, Patrick Cupid. Yes. Um, maybe you can share with us some of your uh, challenges that you were facing during uh, or during the pandemic or the start of the pandemic and how you kind of uh, adapted. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the first thing was it, it's actually been uh, a little bit, well, I don't want to say it's been rewarding, um, but the, through the challenges, I think it's really just been about rethinking the way that the brand is moving forward, you know, and this has really been a great time for brands uh, like my own to sort of reevaluate, like, you know, is, you know, do I make a pivot? Do I continue on um, as business as usual? I think there have been changes in the market and the industry that have been coming, you know, for a number of years. We've seen changes in retail and the way that buyers have been buying and the habits, um, especially in like a lot of the bigger stores, you know, uh, like Lorne & Taylor, Bird of Goodman, Bloomingdale, you know, there's been a conversation around um, a lot of repetitive brands. You know, you go out somewhere and then you you see like the same five or six brands literally in every single store that you go to. And I started to notice that, you know, over the prior two seasons, even before this year began, and I even had a conversation with my mentor about it, uh, you know, that maybe, you know, direct to consumer needs to be a little bit of the way forward. We've seen it for a number of years with larger brands, you know, beginning to do that where they're opening their own flagship stores. And then a number of brands started to follow uh, suit. You know, for example, uh, earlier this year, there was an article in the New York Times uh, about Emily Bode, you know, and she, you know, was very big in Barney's and in a couple of locations. Well, unfortunately, Barney's is gone, you know, um, and but while that was happening, she had opened up, you know, her own store. And I, I was lucky enough to go and meet with her wonderful woman, um, you know, and sort of ask her and get some insight as to why that would happen. Uh, we I've been showing as well for a number of seasons in Paris. Uh, and even walking through there, a lot of the newer or emerging French brands uh, aren't even focused, you know, on a wholesale model anymore. Like they have just been opening their own brick and mortar shops or going, you know, online. I've seen the same thing in China. I was there last October uh, for Market Week and meeting with a number of designers and they have a big like online business, but uh, most of their um, sales have been happening D to C. So when the year came in, you know, I joined a trade show, went back to Paris, was excited. Uh, unfortunately, 
uh, Italy it just shut down, you know, as I'm boarding the plane, Italy's, you know, shutting down. So everyone it's like running to get out, like to get to Paris to the shows. But that really did impact, you know, the number of people that were traveling because, you know, people were afraid. Uh, people, you know, sort of weren't coming out in the numbers that they normally did. Many, many, many brands like myself have seen like, a, you know, cancellation after cancellation of appointment, uh, really because I think people did not know what to do or what was going to happen, how long the quarantine was going to be on. Um, some buyers, you know, were dropping orders, you know, from people. Some of them have just completely gone out of business, which is really unfortunate. Um, and so I, I, when the time came, you know, and, and I sort of saw this coming on, I, you know, I sat back for a moment and said, okay, so this is happening. You know, like the world is being forced into rapid evolution in the way that we do things, in the way that we approach business, in the way that we live, in the way that we communicate. Uh, and then I really started to look at some of the pros and cons. I think the pros are, uh, to Camilla's point, is that people were then able to spend more time at home and look online and they did discover new brands. Well, not only did they discover new brands, they were beginning to value, they were understanding more the value behind smaller brands and consumer less and consuming less and buying better quality. You know, some people say, okay, well, it's more luxury brands and that is part of it, you know, or at least more expensive. But I really think it's just a turn to better quality. You know, I think when you have time to sit back and reflect on things, you know, we've seen boom in home decor. Why? Because people are spending more time at home now and you realize, okay, I can fix the faucet or I don't like my sofa. <laughs> you know, I wanted something do, you know, better. And when you're at home and you're sifting through your closet and you have to get on a Zoom call for a meeting, you, there are a number of things you're thinking about. Do I really look good in this? Because, you know, it's not just in the office on person to person, like, you know, I'm wearing this, you're, you're seeing me, you know? And am I comfortable? Because this is, I'm not going to be here, you know, day to day. And so I began to think of, you know, all these things and what we might be doing going forward. Um, and then even about how my business was positioned. So I took the time and flipped my website and, you know, started building, you know, the e-commerce. Um, I, you know, joined up, you know, with uh, D2B, designed to buyer, and, you know, and work with you guys and several others to really start focusing more on the online presence. You know, I, it's not that I think brick and mortar is dead. I don't believe that. I just believe, you know, it will have another iteration as time right. goes on. Yeah. Right. That's interesting. And Patrick, you have also experienced both in, um, in the U.S. and in Europe, mm -hmm. correct? Um, yes. And it's very interesting because a uh, number of you already uh, uh, shared your global experience. So it's just interesting for me to learn more about like the key differences that maybe Patrick, you can start the key differences that you see between um, these two places, uh, Europe and the States in terms of uh, how advanced they are when it comes to sustainable fashion and maybe um, how, how they're treating it now with COVID-19. And I'm curious to hear all of you after as well. Okay. Um, what I found, well, even just up yesterday, um, I received an article, I follow uh, the industry.fashion, you know, and if you guys do get into the European market, especially the United Kingdom, it is, a, I mean, they're an amazing, incredible newspaper. So, you know, please do check them out because they do a lot of research into the market um, on influencers, on market trends, on what's happening with retail. They've been following COVID, you know, like 19 step by step by step and how it's affecting retail, um, the rents that people are paying. So it's a really great resource of like information to have. And one of the things that they're doing is a webinar on, um, the new PLM systems that, you know, work without coding, you know, to sort of speed things up and streamline, you know, uh, the blockchain, you know, and sort of make things easier. So I've seen a lot of that coming out of Europe, you know, I think they're sort of, okay, well, we need to innovate, you know, really quickly and get on it uh, and make these changes, even in a lot of the showrooms, you know, have, you know, will automatically like, okay, well, we're going to be going to a digital platform, or how do we, you know, swap this out. Uh, but I think these are things that everywhere, even in the United States, I think that people have been looking at uh, for quite a while. Um, as for sustainability, um, I think, you know, Europe and United States are almost hand in hand. I think there's a lot more accessible, 
being in Italy for a while, there are a number, you know, they've been recycling wool and fabrics and materials for a long time. You see a lot of high tech uh, design coming out of Italy as well. And that's because of the recycling program there, where they have access to all of these recycled, you know, polymers, you know, to make fabrics that do I mean, amazing, incredible things, you know, that they're able to turn out. Uh, and we, I think the United States could probably beef up, you know, in that area more um, with, you know, a lot of like either using the recycled materials, you know, I like a beautiful natural fiber, like I can't, you know, deny it, I just do. Um, but there are some really great, you know, recycled materials out there that like can be accessed, you know, depending on what the brand does. So whether it's athleisure or outerwear or, you know, these other avenues, you know, that we can really, really look into. Right. Yeah. Odd, I'm sure you have a lot to, uh, to share with us in that, <laughs> in that matter, because you're the experts of all the materials and you also have the global perspective as well. Um, you work in Asia, if I'm not mistaken. And in Europe, can you maybe elaborate a little bit? Well, um, there is like two things we can maybe have live from Europe. First, uh, in Europe, we have a lot of luxury brands, uh, uh, which understood pretty long ago that uh, sourcing um, the material, the raw material um, is 100% depending on biodiversity. So those brands, they really involved in that. Then, during the COVID period, um, all the shops were closed and at a different time, because in China, they've been uh, under confinement before we did in Europe. In Italy, it was longer than in France and so on. So they had to react pretty quickly um, on digital shopping things, on uh, um, keeping the customer entertained by uh, webinars, by uh, all those social media, TikTok, all those kind of things. That's maybe a point that Europe was pretty reactive. Um, on the other hand, uh, maybe a less good point is that, for instance, some of my customers are fairs, like fabric fairs for lingerie or at leisure or other kind of things. Uh, for instance, um, one of the fair I'm working and I'm collaborating with usually, they have one fair in Shanghai, one in Paris, one in New York. They've been canceling all the fairs. So they had to react pretty quickly and to do like online fairs, which they use the, the global network. It was pretty good. But in Europe, we are not as fast in reacting in terms of changing habits that US can be, I think. So we are very interesting in uh, digital things. All the webinars were given for free. That's, that's amazing, really. But on the other hand, uh, you know, believing in it, believing in uh, the immaterial thing, it's very difficult for Europe. We are, we, I mean, we have great technologies, but we also has months mindset. We are a bit um, uh, behind sometimes. So those are the difficulties I could, I could face or I could testify. And maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the, the digital fair that you mentioned for the materials. How do you even do that? So, uh, for instance, um, one, of the, uh, um, one of the very important challenge now is to be able to produce and to think um, um, digital content, uh, but with strong quality, like with visual, but also with uh, technical uh, thing. I'm not an expert, you know, in IT and all those kind of things, but I've been participating as a speaker, as a um, uh, content provider for those fairs. So I recorded some uh, webinars, for instance, uh, gathering like uh, people from the, um, the sourcing chain. And at the same time, we were able to gather people on the chat. You know, it's like it was... Um, it was like a Tinder thing. So every of us, we were uploading a profile and according to the interest we, we had and what we were looking for, uh, we could match to suppliers, to consistent, to brands and all those kinds of things. So I had some very good meetings uh, with uh, fabric suppliers, for instance. And if the supplier was ready, like uh, one of uh, the lace supplier that I know from Italy, they made the most beautiful video to present the new concept they had. So it was one kind of reaction. Then, thank God, 
uh, the post office is still working on so they can send you know samples and swatches so we can still have the feeling of it because it's it's impossible to to work on fabrics otherwise but at least the first step of being in touch was a bit you know um thanks to those technologies right so we do see a lot of creativity and changing the mindset all over the world right um i'm curious rebecca what do you think do you think that any good will come out of covid 19 maybe in the terms of the mindset of people in terms of sustainability and fashion uh what kind of the opportunities that you uh that you witnessed so far yeah so with all the challenges aside in terms of the opportunities I mean, the United States is just awful in terms of consumption. You know, we are the worst country in the world in our consumptive habits in, in many ways. And the pandemic has forced many of us, now not the whole country is not following pandemic protocols. There are some people whose lives have not changed. And that is why we have 5% of the world's population and 20% of the COVID cases. However, for many people, um, myself included, we've had to have a dramatically different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that has caused us to be more thoughtful and more intentional about so many of our choices. And so many of the avenues for consumption are no longer available. You can't go to a brick and mortar store and go on a, a buying free in the same way now. Um, so realizing that all that is fraught and complicated. And, and another thing is so many people have been really just dumping old clothes at places like Goodwill that then will be shredded or discarded in global markets and places like Haiti that don't need more and more piles of American rejects. Nobody wants this you know, American sporting shirt that has sweat stains on it. Um, so I, so I, yeah, I, I mean, you, you know the deal, right? They're, they're yeah. like, Listen, I'm Haitian and I dress better than you in America, which is true. So, um, and, and I have a number of, of Haitian friends. So I, I think that there are a lot of opportunities here. Best case scenario. Okay. Best case scenario is that the country as a whole best case scenario. Do with the pandemic, which is honestly going to take a new precedent. So if the country as, a, and not to get overly political, but it will take that. Um, so if, the, if we, if Biden is elected and the country as a whole does what it needs to do during the pandemic and we all hunker down, it's going to suck. It's going to be terrible. People are going to go through all kinds of awful things. It's going to happen over the winter for a lot of people who haven't done it yet. Um, however, I hope that that brings about a sustainability renaissance when people are rethinking about their habits, rethinking about what's important to them, not having the same avenues for purchasing quickly and disposing quickly and being more thoughtful about what do they need. And it's, it's a reset because this country really needs that reset. Another asterisk that I'm gonna add too that I think is very important to talk about in the American context as well as the global context is Black Lives Matter. And I think that movement is, um, is it's so important to speak to the specific challenges faced by people who are black in this country. And clearly I am not someone who can speak in as in depth a way about this as many other people. Um, but I have done public defender criminal defense work in this country and I'm trying to become well-versed on some of the issues and have for some time. And there's a lot of great resources to learn more. And the intersectionality piece of it all is realizing that fashion in the United States has been based on exploitation from the very beginning. You had more people who are working at the start of the Civil War in slavery in this country on fashion than you did at the height of the transatlantic slave trade because that slave trade shut down, but then you just used women's bodies to create more people and working on this. So my, another hope of mine is, is the people context of it all. What does sustainability mean in terms of caring for people's lives? And that's also something that I'm working on. So stay tuned, follow along, reach out if you want to chat more. But that's another cross industry piece that I'm working on now is thinking about how do we take some of these social movements in this country and bring it into fashion and realizing that um, our, we're used to cheap products because we're used to slave labor. And we've had it throughout the history of fashion in this country. And we are just in the process now of shutting down things coming from China with the slave labor and the genocide of the Uyghur population there. 20% of the world's cotton is coming from that part. So I could chat for a while um, about this topic, but I, I hope that there's an intersectionality piece. And I also don't know if Black Lives Matter would have 
come about in the same way if there hadn't been a pandemic. Mm-hmm. Too. So I am I'm grateful. And and I and Patrick, you are you're going to be. I, I love your thoughts as well, too. Yeah, no problem. I, I see a lot of nodding and also feel... feel oh, yeah. Yeah. I think... Um, yeah, sure. You know, uh, Rebecca, you touched a, a lot of, like, really, really good points, and I agree with you on so many things. Um, you know first with like the whole issue of sustainability in the country, like even the term sustainability, you know, like I think needs to evolve and change because it, Absolutely. It, it's so broad that it, there's really no the definition as to what that means. And a lot of companies, a lot of brands, both big and small, you know, throw that out or people are asking these questions or how are you sustainable? And I find that it's not really that they want to know how we're sustainable. It's like people are trying to understand exactly what that means. You know, like, you know, are you using recycled fabrics? Is everything natural? Will it biodegrade? Are you taking care of, you know, uh, people and making sure that they get fair wages, like, so that we're not, you know, um, uh, promoting, you know, slave labor. Uh, I, I, it was Carl Lagerfeld who said years ago, you know, if you're going to work in fashion as a designer, you have to accept a certain amount of injustice, you know, in the world. And though he may be, it may have been right for the time, I don't agree with that, you know, and I think that, you know, if we sort of really push to change, you know, that we can make that happen. I think there needs to be a re-education um, for the consumer, especially in the United States, to your point with the overconsumption, but also for the designers and for the companies and the manufacturers. You know, we go out to buy fed, small brands are having a really hard time because, you know, we go out to purchase fabric and then there are these, you know, crazy, you know, minimums that unfortunately a lot of, you know, of us will, are not going to be able to do. And when you have that, then you're forced to buy, you're forced to produce more, you're forced to overproduce. And a lot of that winds up as just waste. You know, we see it in mass market where they're producing producing millions of units to fill all of these stores and it's the same thing. Half of it is never, you know, going to move or go anywhere. So it will wind up in Haiti or, you know, somewhere in Africa or, or wherever else where they're going to dump, you know, the rest of these clothes. Like Salvation Army's been doing for years. And like, you know, we need to think about that. We need to say, okay, well, you know what? No, I'm not producing 2 million units, you know, my, yes, my customer is there, my customer is specific, and hopefully I have 2 million of them spread out all over the world, but I don't need 2 million units right now just for New York City alone, you know, like, that's a little bit excessive, it's a bit much, Um, for, you know, and keeping your clothing longer, you know, growing up, you know, I would see my grandparents um, who were for different age, and they too worked in the garment industry, and so did my mother and father, and, you know, we, there was always a sewing machine in the house. There was, you know, we, you, we would go to the shoemaker when we were little and like, you know, you'd have your shoes repaired or the soles fixed or the shoes cleaned or you'd have your coat mended or things like that let out. Um, Seville Row, where there's tailoring, where a lot of the men, it becomes a generational thing where you inherit your grandfather's or your great grandfather's, you know, blazer or jacket. Sorry, I've got the sounds of New York going. <laughs> um, blazer or jacket. And you basically go back and have it retailed or retooled to fit you. And then it carries on and then you pass it on again. So creating this kind of a special bond between the consumer and their purchases, I think is also really, really, really important. You know, like having these heirloom pieces would help. Um, To touch on Black Lives Matter briefly, you know, Rebecca, don't ever feel that you can't speak to that or that you can't say that. I think other people you know, aside from, you know, I'm, I'm a black male, you know, and what makes me happy and what excites me is to see someone who is not another black person to go in and speak and understand it or want to understand like the conversation around it uh, because it adds validity. You know, it makes the conversation real, not just something that's happening, you know, at your neighbor's house. And well, I don't really know what's going on. You know, when you become part of the conversation, you know, then, you know, people begin to see like, okay, this is really happening. And I think to the point with COVID-19, you know, it sort of put everyone, you know, because everyone is at home and they're seeing what happened to George Floyd and they're having time to read the articles and get the information and understand, oh, okay, wait a minute. This wasn't just 
this frustration or like, you know, this thing that was happening with these other people, like there is something to this there. And so what is this? Let me dig a little bit deeper. Let me find that out. Um, and I think that's also happening, you know, and I think that's really where the movement, because the movement was going on for a while, but I believe that's where it really exploded. It's once people on the outside sort of got involved and said, wait a minute, we don't agree with this either. Like, this is not okay that this is happening. Why is this happening? How long has this been going on? You know, this is not something that just died off with Martin Luther King and other people. And it affects not just, you know, when we say Black Lives Matter, it, it doesn't just affect, okay, well, you know, the police brutality and the killings and all of other things. It also affects the way that we're treated in the workforce, you know, in the fashion industry. You know, Black designers or, or designers of color, I should say, um, have been really pushing the needle, you know, especially in the United States, you know, for American fashion and influencing. Um, I think about Stephen Burroughs and Versailles 76 and how that changed the way that we present fashion and how we see runway shows and all of those, you know, beautiful black women that went out because most of the American designers could not afford the top models because they were already working with a lot of the French designers in that competition, you know, and it's out there, but we don't talk about that, you know, and yet they've changed the world for us in fashion, you know, as a whole forever. And for years and years and years, you know, they would still not get the recognition. They would still not get the space, you know, in the show. Um, it happens to women of Asian descent, you know, in the modeling industry. How often do you see an Asian woman that's the face of a cosmetic brand or something else that someone uses? Um, getting hired for work or, you know, having uh, buyers, you know, come and meet a designer, you know, or, or when they, you know, they, for example, I, people come and look at me and they make an assumption based on what I look like about what I design, you know, or, you know, they see the design and it's just like, oh, wow, it's like this big shock. And it's just like, well, why can't I, <laughs> you know, why, why didn't, why wouldn't you have just automatically connected that? Or why would you have any assumption at all? And it's because of the stigma of racism, um, you know, that even goes down into just the way that we treat each other and the way that we look at each other. And all of these things have to change. Like we have to do better. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I absolutely agree. I see Odd is also absolutely agreeing. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right. When we're talking about sustainability, the whole idea of the definition of it, it's so wide. And it's not just the environmental part. It's about the human beings who are part of mm -hmm. it. It's the way we treat others. It's so many different things. Um, we don't have a lot of time left. I'm going to say that if anyone in the audience have questions, you can write them down in the Q&A part. And we will take one or two questions. But um, just to recap, maybe Camila, uh, you can give us some tips um, of how to, um, to prepare ourselves, as I'm sure we have a lot of designers here in the audience who are listening. What can they do uh, to adjust to this new situation? And what kind of opportunities do you recognize right now? Sure. First of all, I would like to say that something connected to what has been said before, so that the positive thing about the pandemic is that it, br it brought uh, an highlight on many values that were a little bit uh, not on focus till that moment. So I think we had the time to rethink a little bit our lives, all of us, because we were all running and without thinking too much. And then at one point we were locked and we had to think of what we were doing. And it's good that many, many uh, discussion raised and I think this is extremely positive and now as consumers we need to keep thinking of it but also as designers and I think it's the a key moment to work more in partnerships because I think we all cannot survive by ourselves so I think we need to create more a systemic um, cooperation let's say between countries, obviously, but also as more designers, maybe we need to stop being so, uh, maybe, I don't know, trying to make better than others, but maybe make something together and exchange a little bit more the knowledge. I think all the online discussion that have been free during the pandemic have been super positive, but now we keep, we need to keep working in this direction. 
also because maybe my problem is something that the others have already experienced. So I think this is fundamental. And also try to not exaggerate now. Now we all need to uh, keep working definitely and make projects even if it's not so easy because maybe we are a little bit negative and we have been investing a lot and maybe not getting big value. But I think um, it's the moment to show that we have additional values. And also like after the COVID, uh, McKinsey has published a report saying, uh, for example, that consumers will return more quickly to pay full price for quality and timeless goods. So this is really extremely positive. So we need to keep the values that we have re-elaborated and focus on those. Mm -hmm. Yes. Ad, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I like the fact that you like the systemic approach because that's something I really focus on now. Uh, because as Patrick said, sustainability, it's a very large word um, and sometimes it's not uh, precise enough. And for me, sustainability is using three dynamics, the fabric sourcing dynamic, the production dynamic, and the distribution or redistribution dynamic in where you have diversity. That's a very important point. And the, we saw that during the pandemic, uh, all the strong sportswear brands from US like Reebok, Nike, Adidas, and Adidas from Germany, they're really involved during life, uh, uh, sorry, Black Lives Matter uh, in doing special campaigns. They had to. They had to, they, they, and today the brands, they cannot stay in silence. That's not possible. So they have to involve in those three dynamics. And uh, another point that I wanted to say, and uh, for the sourcing uh, thing that you mentioned, Patrick, actually there's that you have the, some mutualization things and uh, dead stock possibility purchase. And uh, in the chat, I put one for you. Uh, I saw, you. thank you. And I don't know if you know it, but, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe it could be a solution for you. Thank you. Already a collaboration. I love it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we're running out of time. Um, so I will say thank you for all of our panelists. You surely gave us some hope. And you're doing, each of you, amazing work in in your own segment and it's just um i can say personally when i had to read your bios and i talked with some of you prior to this panel it was just super inspiring um so keep up the good work um keep up uh making everyone else aware of the importance of sustainability in our world um and hopefully we'll all um get better on the other side of COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, this is the first part of this all um, week, um, uh, Eco Fashion Week, so uh, Digital Eco Fashion Week. So if you want to stay uh, and learn more, the website, you can read more about all of the other opportunities you have for the next days. Thank you very much, everyone, for participating. I wish you health uh, and creativity. So, Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. No Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank pleasure you. meeting you guys and sharing Pleasure today. meeting you. Let's stay in touch. Yes. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Bye.